Thank you for your nice introduction. I am happy to be here, and I hope I will uh, spread some fascination about the uh, life with you. So, um, I conduct, I'm like you heard, bioinformatics uh, researcher, and um, bioinformatics basically application on informatics uh, to biology, and it can solve various problems. Uh, but in this talk, I will be uh, centered to the analysis of human genomes, to, so human DNA, in the area of uh, genetic diseases, especially rare diseases. So for this, uh, some quick intro to biology and genetics. Um, so what is a human genome? Human genome is uh, the entire set of DNA instructions that are found in a cell. Uh, there is a small mitochondrial DNA. Uh, this is not so important, but the most important part is uh, in the chromosomes. Uh, in, there are 23 pairs of chromosomes hidden in the nucleus of the cell. And they, uh, they hold the whole necessary information to create the cell and whole organisms. So we have two pairs, uh, which means that one comes from mother and a second one from father. Then uh, the chromosomes, uh, if you unwind them, there is a, a double helix structure called deoxyribonucleic acid, and it uh, consists of two strands of um, uh, nucleobases, uh, let's say letters, A, C, T, G. Uh, these letters are paired all together, uh, always A with T and C with G. So if we know the sequence of one strand, we uh, automatically know the sequence of the second strand. And how many letters are there in our genomes? Uh, there's three billion letters, so if we want to store it, we can actually fit it in one CD. If someone still uses it, I don't think so. So instead of that, you can print it out. I'm not sure if this is a good idea, but actually someone did it before. <laughs> so this is whole human genome um, printed in, uh, the, like in, the, in the library. So one color is one chromosome. And uh, you see uh, the letters. Uh, this is really like this. That you will not find there anything else than these letters. <laughs> And these are four, four uh, the size is four points. So you would, it would take really long to read. And okay, uh, talking about size of a human genome, is it a big genome or not compared to other organisms? Uh, we are actually quite advanced and complex, but our genome is not the biggest one, as someone might think. Uh, there are other, um, other species that have uh, much bigger genomes, especially the plants and fish or amphibians. Uh, how come is this possible? Uh, the thing is that um, the genome consists of coding part and non-coding part. I will explain. Uh, the coding part, uh, these are genes, and uh, the genes uh, contains uh, the recipes uh, for uh, proteins. The non-coding DNA uh, is, uh, doesn't hold this information. Uh, some, you might hear, hear, heard uh, about junk DNA. It's exactly not a junk DNA, mostly because there are some important uh, like uh, functionalities of this DNA, like a regulation of the gene expression, like which genes are switched on and switched off, and so on. So, now, I told you that uh, there are instructions for creation of the proteins. How do we create a protein? Uh, from DNA. There is the double-stranded DNA hidden in the nucle nucleus. It's hidden in the nucleus uh, because it needs to be protected, uh, like, so there are not happening, uh, like, un uh, un um, the, the changes that we don't want. So, it is, uh, it is actually transcribed. There is a copy of the DNA called mRNA, and this travels outside of the nucleus, and uh, there it's translated into protein. 
it is translated in a special way because the, the, the code, uh, the, the letters are, are read by three, like by three triplets. So you read UUA, the first letters of the mRNA, and uh, you will end up with leucine if you look it up in the, in the table. So basically the protein, you can imagine it as a string uh, with beads of uh, different colors. So we created a protein and uh, the protein is like a, the basic uh, structural and functional uh, unit of our cells. And uh, it actually, I told you about the bead, but here is a 3D structure that is somehow like folded. And um, yeah, those, that's what the protein does uh, do. And uh, basically the function is, um, hidden like in the in the structure of the protein so if you if the structure of the protein is changed then the function its function can be altered this is very cool <laughs> maybe you don't see it like it <laughs> but these are like real pro proteins uh, within our cells uh, and here, so you can imagine on the left uh, upper corner, there is a molecule of water. Yeah, so you can imagine the scale of other proteins, basically, and uh, it represents a cell, actually. So on the right side, here, there is a nucleus, and this is the DNA with the proteins that are necessary for transcribing and translating them and maintaining the DNA. Then we can see a biological membrane here. And there are some proteins inserted into the membranes. And uh, the, it's like a protein complex, it's not just one protein. But uh, actually, you can see these are like uh, protein machines that are tirelessly working in each our cell uh, just now. Yeah, if not, then we are dead. <laughs> so. Yeah, the, the good thing is if you, you go to the website, you can really click there and see the real atomic structure of these proteins. And now I would like to show you how the molecular machines work. So this is a video uh, which shows uh, white blood cell, uh, here in blue, <laughs> actually, which travels through the bloodstream, and uh, the cell receives a signal that there's some infection in the body. Uh, so the cell needs to like prepare and go out to catch, uh, catch the like insider, let's say. It's not necessary to understand everything. I think it's just fascinating to see it. Like this is in the close. These are the building blocks of uh, the cells. Like the structure. And the structure is uh, constantly like uh, appearing and disappearing, let's say. Assembling and disassembling. This is a protein a complex that uh, inside of this ball there are other proteins that are carried to another place in the cell. This is a mRNA released from the nucleus. There's molecular machine that transcribes it into a protein, the green one. Now this is assembled, and the yellow thing is protein. This is other proteins, and they are traveling to some other part of the cell.
Yeah, now the ball is like um, merging with other structure of the cell and releasing the proteins to its final direction. escaping the vein and it's going for the inside. So it was quite a lot of things that had to happen so the cell knows and can perform its action. Okay, so this was when everything was working well. What happens if there is some problem? <laughs> Actually, as in programming, uh, there are various possibilities. Nothing happens, we have some bug in a comment, yeah, it's okay. Uh, this can be just variation because everyone is, uh, writes the comments differently. So these are just the differences between individuals. Then uh, there can be some problem which is alternative to disease or it can be some fatal error which is a death. So, sir, it maybe you, you would imagine that if the, there is such a big problem as a death that you would need some big change in the code, uh, like the genetic code, I mean now, in the, in the DNA. But no, the one letter change can cause death, actually. How this is possible? Uh, if we go back to the genetic code and we are um, like uh, performing the, the the, the, like translating the information, there can ha happen various scenarios. There, there are like, a, the, the effect is no, the, it's silent. Then it can be missense where basically the one beat is exchanged. So there is the proline to threonine. Uh, there, it could be a nonsense variant, let's say mutation in this case, that uh, leads to a premature uh, termination of the protein, so there's part of the protein missing. Or there can be some insertion and deletion, and it can result actually in alteration of the reading frame where the rest of the protein is completely different, something completely else than it's necessary. So we have var different variants. And uh, based on its effect, as you, as you saw that it can be from no effect to very high e effect. And we have uh, basically variant frequency. The, the very variants with, uh, that are like uh, with big effect are usually um, like uh, by the evolution, like um, getting, the body is getting rid of this. And um, the ones that are not so little, uh, well, the little, we cannot see it in the population completely, uh, but we, uh, if there are some, there are rare diseases. Uh, there are also diseases, genetic diseases, that are uh, caused by more genes, like, like a synergy of more genes. And uh, there are the modifying factors, that's why we are different, so these are not uh, very, these are completely normal. And we have sometimes some beneficial alleles that uh, give some advantage to the organism. So here we will concentrate uh, mostly to the rare diseases, uh, basically because these are like extreme, um, extreme uh, um, versions of the mutations, what can happen. And it's very useful uh, to concentrate to them. So talking about rare diseases, what is a rare disease? Rare disease um, is... Uh, disease that uh, affects fewer than one people in uh, 2000. The one people in 2000, yeah. 72% uh, of them are genetic, 70% uh, of them start in childhood, and uh, there are more than 6,000 different diseases. But if we take all together these uh, 6,000 diseases, it affects uh, up to 6% of uh, population, so, which means that it's not so rare. And actually here at uh, the conference, uh, I assume there can be like 1,000 people, so probably 
or statistically, there could be like between 45 and uh, 59 people uh, affected by some rare disease. And now I'm talking just about rare diseases, not other genetic diseases. Uh, so, yeah, there are some examples of rare diseases. Maybe you heard about some. Maybe you noticed this eye bucket challenge. The people did this not because they are stupid, <laughs> but because they wanted to raise awareness about uh, one uh, rare disease in particular, the ALS, the amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Or, uh, I don't know, as in uh, uh, other countries, but here, maybe in Czech, the Czech Republic, maybe you could notice uh, some uh, donations organized by the families uh, where of spinal muscular atrophy, SMN1, that, uh, because uh, there was a treatment that uh, wasn't paid and uh, they wanted this treatment. So uh, it was in um, media, so maybe heard about some of these diseases. What is it about them? They affect people of all ages are progressive, they are worsening over time and leading to death, potentially, not all of them. Uh, they can affect any part of the body and uh, have various symptoms, uh, physical, neurological, developmental, or behavioral. And uh, what is true for many of them, the genetic cause is not known. The patients are very often going from one doctor to another, and uh, they are undiagnosed for years or even decades or uh, for whole life. So this has a big social and emotional impact to, to them and their families. So why should we study the rare diseases? One thing is to help the patients to treat them, uh, because uh, the thing is that there is treatment just for 5% of uh, the diseases, and the diagnosis is important usually for uh, like a successful treatment because many of time uh, you cannot reverse what was already broken in the body. So then it's for family planning and also uh, the people can have a peace of mind if they know what's happening. The thing is, as I already said, the diseases are not so rare and uh, important thing uh, the rare diseases are uh, great models for studying cell physiology and photophysiology, and uh, they can provide us with new insights into biological function of disease-causing gene, uh, which help us to better understand the complex diseases. The thing is that uh, there are between 20 to 25,000 of genes, uh, but the function is not known for many of them, so there are still a lot of work to do. So, uh, there are various rare diseases, but a good thing is the approach how to study them is uh, the same for all of them, or can be, uh, there are some variations, but uh, basically what we need to do is to read the uh, DNA, read all of the, read the important letters, let's say, and find the, uh, the change of the letter or some other alteration. So how do we read the DNA? Uh, and how do we read a human genome? Actually, uh, anyone knows uh, when was the first human genome sequenced? Some guesses? No? Okay, so it was in 2001, actually. So this is when we, uh, for first time, could read the whole genetic information um, and the project uh, took 13 years, and it cost uh, $3 billion. So it was really expensive. The price of the sequencing of human genome uh, was dropping, and uh, uh, it was following the Moore's law. Uh, and here uh, was the change in uh, like 2008. And the change uh, is because there were like a next generation sequencing technology available and it was spread. And all together with uh, like uh, knowing the reference genome, it helped us to sequence uh, for um, reduced price. And now basically we are at uh, $500 per uh, human genome. So it's more accessible. 
So I mentioned uh, two different technologies. There is the Sanger sequencing, the Fisherman, uh, that was used for sequencing the first human genome. And he is able to catch just, just let's say, one gene. And then we have the NGS sequencing. And uh, this method is capable of taking all of the genes from the pool and sequence them at once. So this is a very big advantage that we have. How does it work? Uh, we collect uh, biological samples, bugs, uh, blood, or uh, swabs, the buccal swabs. Then we uh, take the extract the DNA, and we cut it in a small pieces. We take these small pieces and put them to the sequencer, and we receive uh, the FASTQ file, which contains the sequences. <laughs> And the sequences are around 100 base pairs uh, with the like, second generation of sequencers. So imagine that we take the library and cut it in 100 letters. What a mess. So this is the Illumina sequencer. Uh, this is where you put uh, the DNA on this uh, glass slide. And then the machine gives you the sequence. Imagine if we would be like a James Bond <laughs> who was able to uh, sequence DNA on way because he had this cool device that could in insert into the computer, pour the DNA into it, and just uh, read it in real time. So, well, we are there. <laughs> It's me in 2017 <laughs> using this device. And uh, yeah, it's not so, it doesn't read so many sequences, but the advantage there, it has other advantages. It's called Pinion, and the technology is called nanopore sequencing. Uh, what is the difference then uh, from the previous one? Uh, the difference is that there is no fragmentation. It's capable of uh, reading the long molecules uh, of a length like a kilobases or a megabases, like number of letters. Base pair means uh, how many letters you can read, basically. So uh, it is very cool. This is how it works. Uh, this is a biological membrane, basically a similar one like uh, you saw in the video here. And uh, there is a protein machine, <laughs> nano machine, that uh, takes the DNA and translocates it through, through a spore. And um, it's, there is a, like electric uh, current. And uh, basically, we are measuring the changes in the electric current as the DNA is passing. And every letter produces a different uh, change. So this is how we can read it. So this is. A great technology, which is also the advantage that you can just uh, take a bag and go anywhere to sequence. Anyone, where was this sequencing performed? Do you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> because the thing is that you cannot take uh, the DNA, uh, if you want to study what's happening with the DNA, you cannot take it back because it got uh, like uh, changed, basically, during the during the space traveling. So now we have the sequences. Uh, we prepare the sample, we sequence it, and we have the sequences. So what do we now do now uh, so we can identify the causing, uh, the disease-causing genes or, and make new discoveries? Uh, the files, um, the raw files, uh, basically, if, uh, are quite big. For a whole genome, it's 150 gigabases. Uh, why, if the genome size is this? Because you need to read the genome more times, because there are errors in the readings. So basically, you need to compensate and uh, with the like reading it more times. So, so it's quite big. And uh, there is another application called whole exome sequencing. And this is basically 2% uh, of the genome. And these are the genes. Actually, genes are just 2% of our genomes. 
So this is a very convenient way to sequence because it's cheaper, uh, the analysis is easier, and it's very probable that the co disease-causing mutation is lying within this region. And uh, the targeted sequencing, you can also choose just some genes, not all of the genes. Let's say you are studying uh, heart diseases, so you just say the you can choose just some genes that are known to be uh, causing uh, the heart diseases. Yeah, so actually I had a, there was a funny because a friend of mine told me, oh, I have my genome sequenced. Can I send it to you? I said, yes. And she sent it to me by email. So, <laughs> okay. So it wasn't a genome. It was just a couple of variants, actually. And uh, maybe you came across this, this as like the, uh, it's even less genes than the targeted sequencing. Um, it's like the an um, ancestry and my heritage, for example. Maybe you did it, some of you. So yeah, this is not a whole genome. <laughs> Maybe you would like to see how the raw sequences are uh, in, 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 in like, what is the data format, let's say. So it's, the sequences can be stored in the FASTA format, uh, the first one. This is how the reference sequence is stored, for example. For the sequences that we receive from a sequencer, it's a fast queue. The queue stands for uh, quality, and basically uh, it's because there is information about uh, how uh, how quality, which quality has the has this letter, how we can rely on uh, that it's correctly read. So this is what we are using, and now we would. Basically, yeah, as you imagine the, the library in 100 uh, letters, uh, cut it into 100 uh, letter pieces. So we want to know uh, from where every uh, fragment or every, every like, yeah, the sequence came. So this is a read mapping. It's like a puzzle. You can imagine a puzzle uh, where there are some missing pieces. Uh, there are some broken pieces. These are the sequencing errors. There are duplicated pieces. Uh, these are repetitions. The, our genome is full of repetitions. And there can be also some contamination. So basically, we, this is the reference genome. You can imagine it as a, the box of the, like the, the picture that you have for the puzzle. And you are trying to find the place of each of the sequence. Yeah. This is the result. This is a BAM file. Uh, this is binary form of the SEM file, the sequence alignment map. And basically what is uh, important here, it's the sequence uh, the, that we were uh, matching to the reference. Here is an information about where it goes to the reference. It starts at position seven and goes to the position 30. And this is like encoding if uh, the letter is uh, matching the reference or there is some insertion or some deletion. So this is how it's encoded. If you visualize it uh, in a genome browser, it looks like this. And uh, here you can nicely see also the difference between uh, genome sequencing and exome sequencing where there are just the genes and the rest is not covered. So now we are interested in uh, the variants. So variants, uh, we basically looking for the places where uh, the sequence uh, of the uh, per person is uh, missing, uh, like uh, different from the reference sequence. So here we have the variation at this position, and uh, it has different uh, uh, different letters uh, for mother and father. This is the variant call format. This is just for your reference. This is like a list of the variants. Now, what we do with the variants? It's like uh, finding a needle in a stack of needle because it's just a list. So uh, basically what we do is we have the patient sequence compared to reference, and we want to know what uh, the rest of the population has at these positions. And we are interested in uh, rare uh, variants that are not present in the population. 
Then we want to know something about the sequences, uh, about the variants, sorry. Uh, so we remove the low quality ones and uh, uh, then we annotate them with information from various biological databases. There are a lot of them and contains different information about frequency, about their biological functions, about where they are in the cell. So um, many things like that. And then you are trying to filter based on uh, this information and uh, find the one variant. There, here is it, how long actually does it take to perform the sequencing experiment for genome, exome, or targeted sequencing? So uh, depending on a machine that you have, because uh, you cannot analyze genome on your laptop, uh, this is in the CPU hours, so you can, you can calculate how would, much would it take on your HPC or, or what you need um, as a specification for the cloud machine. So here is a summary of the bioinformatical workflow. If we are lucky, we are ahead of the candidate variant. If we have the variant, it's a good idea to make a validation. For this, we call the fishermen because we already know which gene it is located in, and we uh, make sure that it's real. Then we check the family if uh, all people with the variant are ill, and, and then it's uh, good to find another family, not, not non-relative family, uh, and check if the variant is also there. And uh, if we don't know more, then we need to perform in vitro and in, uh, like studies in vitro and in vivo, and to learn about if this variant is really uh, like producing uh, this um, the, the, let's say the picture of the disease in the cells, yeah. So, if the variant is confirmed as a disease causing, yeah, so what do we do? If the treatment is there, that's cool. It's not very likely, <laughs> as I told you before, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, but maybe there are some drugs that affect the same metabolic pathway. And if we, if we now understand how it works, uh, basically, the, the gene, uh, then we can find some substance and repurpose this, uh, this medicament for another disease. If there's no treatment, we at least can help the family with genetic counseling and uh, family planning, so we can avoid uh, that they have another uh, kid uh, with uh, the disease, for example. And then it's good... Uh, to let the world know about it, if it's something uh, not very widely known. So publish, submit it to databases. And if you need to perform some studies, then you can connect with other researchers. Uh, there is a, a gene matcher, for example, which uh, is, uh, someone told me that it's like a Tinder for biologists. So basically the interest in the same gene. Yeah, so uh, then you, uh, yeah. If the variant is not identified, what do we do? Uh, we will check if it's well sequenced, because sometimes the quality of sequencing is not very good. Uh, so uh, if not, we sequence again. Then we can on also reanalyze it with different tools, settings. Uh, also, there are different versions of reference. And uh, so we can also uh, wait and reanalyze it later with the novel findings. It uh, many times helps. Uh, we can also try the long reads, the, the cool uh, nanopore sequencing, and also there's a possibility that it's not genetic. The good thing uh, this is that thanks to the NGS sequencing, the clinical diagnosis uh, improved from 1%, that was when just the fisherman was there, to 50%, which is a great hope. Yeah, but what about a Python, right? <laughs> so, uh, in this bioinformatic workflow, uh, the Python, many tools, uh, basically in the bioinformatics, usually there are some tools for the, like, let's say, standard tasks that you just uh, put them all together into some pipelines. Some of them are written in Python already. And also, uh, there is uh, the Bioconda, which uh, 
is a channel for Anaconda where you can install a lot of biological packages that are uh, important for the NGS analysis. So, yeah, then um, as you are uh, piping the programs all together, there is a snake make, which is written uh, directly in Python uh, that can help you with this task, or Nextflow or Viddle. The cool thing about Nextflow is there is an NF core a portal where are already uh, done, um, done uh, pipelines that you can just use. So this is a great thing. So basically, or along there is the the, the Python. Uh, there is also a BioPython, which is a tool for computational molecular biology, and it lets you manipulate the sequences. Uh, it uh, allows you to like somehow compare them all together, and also do some uh, population genetics, structural bioinformatics, and also connect uh, with the biological databases. Yeah, here's just an example, funny quote about, uh, as I told you, how to <laughs> get from DNA to protein. So this is done in BioPython. And then, important uh, for the analytical part, where you are making sense of the, of the variants, Python is very useful uh, because in many labs they are using just Excel uh, to, to filter the sequences and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, for this, Pandas, uh, Jupyter, NumPy is very, very cool. And uh, or there is also a package, SikitPy. I don't have personal experience with this one, but um, it also looked cool. Okay, and one case study at the end. So the patient, it was a healthy concussion female, and uh, she experienced uh, three miscarriages at uh, eight, uh, eight or 10 weeks of pregnancy. Uh, she underwent many, many examinations, and the only thing that was found was uh, like a uh, in her sputum lungs, uh, there was detected the meningococcal streptococcal infection, nothing more. Uh, she was treated with antibiotics, but other, uh, on, yeah, other things, she was healthy. So, the, yeah, so sh she decided to, to get uh, her sequ uh, genome sequence, and uh, there was one gene, MDHFR, uh, mutation, uh, homozygous mutation, and uh, basically this mutation reduces the enzyme activity to uh, 30 uh, percent. This is, you, you see the real mutation in the genome browser. This is the pathway that it affects. Uh, basically, uh, this gene acts here and converts uh, the folic acid to another substance, to 5-MTHF. So, uh, yeah, the, the enzyme function is reduced, and in a literature, PubMed, uh, there is a PubMed, so, so she, she performed the PubMed search, actually, and found a treatment where they were uh, comparing two different uh, treatments for this uh, particular mutation. And uh, the treatment worked very well. It was almost the same as in the control group. So she underwent uh, the treatment. Uh, with a bit modified protocol, basically instead of the folic acid, she took the, the like later sub one, the 5-methyl THF, because there was another study about that, and she was successful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So yeah, it was, it, it, uh, this wasn't a rare disease, but it's like actually there's another rare disease of, the, of this same gene that uh, by understanding function of this gene, it has implications for many of us. Yeah, and uh, the thing is that it takes for around 15 to 17 years uh, to uh, get the knowledge found in our research to a clinical practice. Yeah, it's a long time to go, and uh, yeah, it takes time. And actually, there is um, like uh, in, uh, 
the boss of my lab did a re like on, um, retrospectively looked at uh, how the patients get uh, the kidney patients get there, and 25% of the families diagnosed with uh, the kidney disease were like a result of direct family referral, and uh, basically the pediatricians uh, didn't like uh, help them to find the center and to to know the disease. So actively pursuing cell diagnosis can actually be useful. There are a lot of networks that can help you with this, and you can find the place probably where they are specialized uh, to the condition. Okay, so thank you. Okay, thank you, Anna. It was fascinating. Thank you very much. Uh, because of the technical issues, we took all the time, so we don't have time for questions, but feel free to find Anna on the hallway and stick here because in five minutes we'll host lightning talks in this, in this hall. Thank you, Anna. Thank you again. Thank you.